Lili Santiago, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, for the invitation to speak about Sierra and his music, a subject that lends itself to limitless exploration. So let me share a few words about that. Roberto is one of the foremost composers of Puerto Rico and one of the most important Latino voices in American contemporary music. Sierra's 127 compositions and counting encompass an array of music written for chamber orchestra, wind and choral ensembles, vocal and keyboard works, concertos, and now five symphonies. This paper provides, as I mentioned, a new chapter of Sierra's biography, detailing a critical phase of his professional development from 1976 through 1992. I use Salman Akhtar's concept of third individuation as an analytical tool to explain Sierra's unique works, um, how Sierra's unique works constitute the outcome of a complex compositional self adapted to migration and recurrent homecomings, a process that has been depicted as the Puerto Rican-American revolving door diaspora. Akhtar has described the consolidation of a mixed identity, consequent on migratory shifts, as a process of individuation, specifically third individuation. Akhtar borrows from the separation individuation theory developed by Hungarian psychoanalyst Margaret Mahler concerning adult life reorganizations of the self that result from defining events such as marriage, career advancements, and childbearing. Akhtar describes an ambivalent phase where the immigrant or new citizen faces discomforting anxieties that create a representational, a self-representational split, eventually resolved through the mending and mixing of drives, effects, familial and new affiliations, languages and cultures. The result is a reconsolidated hybrid identity to which I add the concept of a kaleidoscopic self to bring to consideration the dynamic, multifaceted nature of the process that ensues. Composer Abraham Roberto Desiderio Sierra Enriquez, known as Roberto Sierra, was born on October 9, 1953 in Vega Baja, Puerto Rico. Growing up in this idyllic setting, Sierra's childhood was periodically interrupted, though, by adverse events leading to a sense of loss and introspection. In 1960, Sierra's father, Desiderio, established his first fruitful business, Casa de Oficina e Comercio, selling home appliances. The inventory included several Wurlitzer pianos, as well as jukeboxes known as veioneras. Desiderio brought home a French provincial upright piano, an instrument that was then becoming more accessible to middle class households. The instrument was originally intended for Sierra's sister, Gloria Milagros, named, nicknamed Cuquita. When Desiderio Sierra was diagnosed with liver cancer, eventually dying on 19 October 1967, inasmuch as Cuquita lost her enthusiasm for the piano, Sierra was intensely drawn to it, describing autodidactic piano studies which function as a diversion and psychosocial outlet. In her studies, Mahler described the process of attachment transference to an external object as a means of coping with an unavailable relationship important to the child. Sierra recalls playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, a hauntingly moving composition that intensely captures feelings of mourning, subjectively connected to Sierra's loss of his father. As a teenager, age 14, Sierra seems to have fashioned a sense of paternal manifestation through the interactivity with the piano and giving the instrument's imposing presence and expressive capabilities, it would have been a fitting psychological choice. As Sierra's interest progressed, he made known to his mother, Gloria, also known as Cuca, that he wished to pursue piano studies. 
Sierra was locally tutored by Cecilia Negron Talavera, or Doña Ceci, who prepared him for the Puerto Rico Conservatory's entrance exams, an institution founded by Catalan cellist Pau Casals in 1959. Sierra received a bachelor's degree in music and diplomas in piano and composition. Sierra's ideas also broaden in the course of a bachelor's degree in the humanities from the University of Puerto Rico. Through his education, Sierra acquired a lifelong curiosity for the disciplines of visual art, philosophy, politics, and social criticism, motley components of his music and personal interests. The Puerto Rican diaspora from the 1960s to present has been described by scholars as, re as a revolving door phenomenon of recurring departures and returns due to education, work, and extended familial networks. Like many of his contemporaries, in 1975, Sierra participated in a search for education beyond the confines of the island. He applied for Juilliard School of Music in New York, but was not selected. The following year, Sierra expanded his search to the European continent and was accepted at the Royal College of Music. During this time, Sierra accessed the music of artistic exponents like Pierre Boulet, Carl Heinz Stockhausen, Georg Ligeti, Heinze, Luigi Nono, and many others. He recalls attending a live lecture by John Cage in addition to theater and opera, activities which fortify his desire to becoming a composer. Following studies at the Royal College, Sierra moved toward the exploration of electronic and computer music. He spent a year at the Institute of Sonology in Utrecht, 1978, where sharper artistic decisions came to view, bringing Sierra closer to a traditional music composition. A captivating point in Sierra's development, especially in this period of third individuation, is that in the constitution of his own identity, he has established a constant drive to refine personal and musical concepts, some of which obtain while a student of George Ligeti. At a seminar by Ligeti at the music festival in Centre de Conte, Eau de Provence, 1979, attending composition students were asked to submit scores for review and comments. Sierra submitted a toccata with extremely ambitious, nearly unplayable rhythms. Obviously, the work attracted Ligeti's attention who invited the 26-year-old Puerto Rican to join his course at the Hochschule für Musik in Hamburg, where Sierra remained until 1982. Tutoring exchanges happened exclusively at Ligeti's home every Tuesday starting at 2 p.m. and running until 7 or 8 in the evening. The class entailed group discussions on art, culture, music, science, and politics, as well as the sharing of scores and recordings. This informal, open topic, semi-structure, small group forum, five or six students, reflected Ligeti's unconventional approach to music pedagogy and would certainly merit further discussions in terms of innovative, innovative teaching formats. <coughs> A fascinating episode of musical interaction with Ligeti was when Sierra introduced the composer to African rhythms. Toward the end of the 1970s, Ligeti was experiencing a creative vacuum, his opera Le Grand Macabre, signal an aesthetic dead end. Paul Griffiths writes that after two additional harpsichord pieces, a four-year period of silence followed. Sierra brought Ligeti the final disc of Banda Linda, uh, which I show here, a tribe from Central Africa whose extended wooden pipes function as horns playing in melodious polyrhythms. Ligeti began to be fascinated by the idea of African polyphony. It opened up the possibilities for him outside the European realm. The inspirational impact was gigantic, and it is fair to say that Sierra represents one of the main influences of Ligeti's stylistic change. 
Sierra has been likewise impressed by the culture exchange with Ligeti. And in no ambiguous terms, a three-year residence in Hamburg abetted Sierra's self-development as a composer. Not just in the adoption of traits like rigor and discipline, but also in terms of intellectual knowledge, Sierra took many ideas and viewpoints that became part of his kaleidoscopic expression. For example, the admixing of cultural components. On one occasion, Sierra wrote a song cycle, Conjuros, Conjurations 1982, based on Afro-Caribbean songs. The song cycle certainly spoke to a central aspect of his identity that hadn't until then operated at a fully conscious level. In finding his Caribbean self, Sierra discovered a distinctive quality which could extend to endless experimentation, shades, nuances, and elements constitutive of a unique stylistic mark. Ligeti took great delight in the song cycle, personally promoting it as Saye Playel in Paris. This appears to have been a meaningful moment in Sierra's development. He notes, quote, that was when I kind of found my own voice in this. I kind of figured out something. There was a moment in myself that I found this groove and when I figure out how to do this. And surprisingly, perhaps at the end of 1982, Sierra felt that he had attained everything that could be achieved through his studies in Europe. He decided it was time to return to Puerto Rico and set out on his own. This finding of one's voice meant simultaneously the maturing of a sense of self along with a transformative cultural turn. The experience can be understood as the conciliation between root self and immigrant self a singular moment of psychological homecoming. Upon his return to Puerto Rico, Sierra met Virginia Ramirez de Arellano, here present. They married in 1985, and Sierra became stepfather of two young adults, Adolfo Javier and Maria Eugenia, Maru, ages 14 and 12. At the same time that the return of Puerto Rico meant the addition of joyful and new familial ties, professionally, Sierra found many obstacles along the way. His European stay, studying at prestigious institutions, did not yield a tenure track position in music. In fact, Sierra started at the University of Puerto Rico as assistant to the director of cultural activities. It was a welcoming surprise then when a board member of the Puerto Rico Conservatory championed Sierra's hiring for the position of dean and later chancellor. Being a part of the historical developments in his country is obviously very important to him. Speaking of his identity as a person and a composer, he notes, quote, I think my legacy hopefully will be that I produce music at a very high level, but that is essentially music from Puerto Rico. He adds, quote, in my music, I represent essentially myself. In 1986, the Festival Casals of Puerto Rico had asked two composers to write a new work, one which would be performed by a guest orchestra, the Detroit Symphony, and one to be performed by the Puerto Rico Symphony Orchestra, led by guest conductor Zdenek McCall. Sierra's work, Jubilo, converted into a giant professional springboard when Macau extended the offer to conduct the work in New York City. In 1987, Macau featured Jubilo at Carnegie Hall. Analogous to Sierra's, uh, to Ligeti's swift captivation for Sierra's music, Macau proposed a two-year fellowship with the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra with the support of Meet the Composer program a program designed to champion American music among US symphony orchestras and to promote the rapprochement of composers with uh, local symphony members as well as uh, local communities. John Duffy, founder of Meet the Composer program, recount recounted how Zdenek McCall appeared in his office one day with a highly enthusiastic attitude, explaining, quote, all the things he would do and how much it meant to him that Roberta was the person to meet and that he would be a strong advocate. He made a compelling presentation, said Duffy. 
Obviously, the appeal of Sierra's music is gripping. There is always a freshness of sound, an up-to-datedness that makes it modern and relevant. That, mixed with a Puerto Rican descendancy, makes for something truly unique. Frances Richard, speaking on behalf of the of the Meet the Composer program. She was the former board president of Meet the Composer, notes, quote, it's very important to have had someone like Roberto because his music tells you who he is. We don't have that all the time. So aside from the distinctive combination of musical and ideational elements, what makes Sierra's music unique? Writing for the New York Times in 1987, Donald Hennehan titled a piece, To Understand the Music Should We Meet the Composer? He argued that the chance of meeting the composer was not only hard to resist, but that having the artist as a personal guide is often the quickest way to uncover the deeper layers of any new work. An accompanying cartoon here, reads, if the composers of the past could be invited into one room and allowed to mingle with their listeners, we might find that they act pretty much like other people. Well, so you have two composers here today. <laughs> the construction of the aura of genius surrounding classical music had been many centuries in the making and has been expressed in cultural settings in the form of elegant symphonic halls, in the rituality of entrances and exits of musicians on stage, and even in the formality of the attire, usually black. Yet Meet the Composer's roster included diverse voices, such as Roberto Sierra, Robert Rodriguez, and several women like Tanya Leon, John Tower, and Shulamit Run, whose very presence in concert programs signify the gradual transformation of a national music system whose not so distant past included segregated facilities for blacks, natives, and Latinos. It is refreshing to hear thus the voice of someone who knows how to occupy the space that rightfully belongs to Latinos in society. After a long journey of learning about the world, living abroad, marriage, raising children, and incessantly trying to find a place within the American music landscape, Sierra's music represents many arrivals. A psychological and professional coming of age with deep implications to Sierra's psyche and expression. Like Akhtar discussion of the interlinked, interlinked strands in the fabric of identity change in immigrants involving many dimensions of drive and effect, interpersonal and psychic space, temporality and social affiliation, Sierra's music brings forth a kaleidoscopic distribution of colors represented as memories, ideas, philosophies, visual art and voices of many worlds and many eras which variously distributed among his wide range of works can only be the combination of that which has entered his psychological stream. During this important period of professional development or third individuation, Sierra wrote two major works, Cantos Populares and Memorias Tropicales, 1983-1985. Spanish titles enunciate the composer's articulation of his collective self through the expression of ethno-linguistic ties. Further, Sierra describes the use of Caribbean, Hispanic, and Puerto Rican themes, songs, and rhythm as a process of self-recollection, in that that means memory and at times a way to subvert dominant music discourses. Sierra notes that in Cantos Populares, he made the conscious effort to implement Latin cultural elements, drawing from the popular and folkloric music of Puerto Rico. The Squire piece is based on the transformational possibilities of artistic material interpreted by Sierra through a seamless alternation of musical ideas from sound, that is, to melody, to noise, and back to sound in an ABA format. The melody evokes the OE, OE quality of folk singing almost like a poggiaturas in simple triadic formations. The underlying intention is a visual, sonic, and sensorial remembrance of the countryside settings where Sierra grew up, such as buzzing, wind, and nighttime. 
the concept of music as gradations that slowly change from one color or idea into the next comes from the triptych painting Garden of Earthly Delights from Hieronymus Bosch. In it, a cacophony of earthly and fantastic figures share whimsical scenes where the actions are not altogether clear. And I'll share the music uh, with you now. This is from the New London Choir, 1987, conductor James Wood. This is followed by movement two, a lullaby which establishes a more contemplative mood, and the third contrasting movement, Canto Nocturno, which features salsa rhythms and the sound of nocturnal insects, such as the yok yok of crickets and the coqui of Puerto Rican miniature frogs. Memorias Tropicales, a similar mixing of cultural and inter-art traditions also primes this work, Memoras Tropicalis, however, in a completely different ensemble format. And I'll play for you now movement one, and um, hopefully the sound will be adjusted. It was a little loud earlier, but uh, we'll see. Harmonically abstract and presenting contrasting patterns of pointed rhythms, Memorias Tropicales, dedicated to Sierra's wife, Virginia, is a modernist approach to the string quartet. The four movement piece incorporates ideas and sonic memories of Sierra's life in Puerto Rico, namely Memoria Urbana, Horizonte, En la Noche Oscura, and Final Sin Fin. The first movement highlights the abrasive nature of urban sounds through the infusion of stark rhythms and gestures. The music is transitional between something rhythmic that by virtue of being so fluid ceases to be rhythmic. In a way, the interplay of instrumental voices nearly takes the piece out of the realm of what most people would expect of string music and twists it in a quasi-electronic quality by calling upon unusual sonic expansions that look like envelopes. Another interesting aspect of this piece is register displacement, migrations toward extreme highs and lows. The fourth movement, Final Sin Fin, features the string instruments in unusual percussive fashion, performers tapping the body of the instrument, as well as surprising sections of vocal utterance where performers vocalize instead of playing. Final Sin Fin, as the title denotes, gradually dissipates into silence without a clear, precise closure denoting the persistence of memory. Generally speaking, even though Sierra often enough, yet always open to new ideas. 
and the mixing of past and present, Puerto Rican, European, Americanness, Sierra's compositional self is projected into the social lived realm. Sierra's adult life changes promoted music that combines the colors of places he visited along the way, the people that populate his life, and the material culture, books, visual art, music that he came in contact with. The music can be understood as a kaleidoscope where at each turn a particular assemblage of colors becomes more prominent while others recede into the background, albeit the preference for the Puerto Rican hue is always imminent. Because of such dynamically placed features, Sierra's music summons us to appreciate a world rich in colors and timbers, from tropical flowers and insects to nightly visions and mythical figures. His intellectual quest can be simple and direct or tempestuous, full of contrasts, abrupt cuts, improvisations, descent, and harmonic extremes. The music is inevitably personal, yet always, always socially inspiring, filled with masterful originality and intoxicating freedom. And Roberto, can you stand up for a moment? Here it is. <laughs> So to close, um, excerpts from his most recent CD, Boleros y Montunos, uh, with pianist Juan Carlos Garvallo, can be found at soundcloud.com. And also, again, to reiterate, please come join uh, the premiere of Misa Latina with two pianos, percussion, and choir this Sunday at 3 p.m. at Calle Playhouse, Hunter College, with conductor Harold Rosenbaum. Thank you very much.